I'd like, I'd like to begin. I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. I hope that you all are ex as excited as I. We're here to listen to one of the greatest benefactors of our human race, perhaps ever. And Roger's going to tell you more about him in a few minutes, but I just wanted to say here that I think, as everyone knows, he is the father of the Green Revolution that is credited credited with saving the lives of 1.5 human beings. 1.5 billion human beings. <laughs> now you'll remember that. 1.5 billion human beings who would otherwise have succumbed to famines, He's also credited with saving our world from environmental disaster. If the Green Revolution had not increased the productivity of farmland, there'd be little room for rainforests or parks, or for some of you, even golf courses. Important for our purposes is that he achieved these results through plants. The Donald Danforth Plant Science Center attempts to follow in the footsteps of Norman Borlaug. Our worldwide mission is to better the human lot through plants, to promote human health and welfare through improved nutrition, to preserve and enhance the environment by sustainable agriculture. That is agriculture that does not overuse fresh water or pesticides, agriculture that sustains and restores the land so that it is as productive 100 years from now as it is today. We want our great-grandchildren to inherit a livable world, a world that can provide food, fresh water, renewable products, parks, forests, and natural beauty. That sounds like utopia, but <clears throat> modern science gives us many tools, and our information systems give us other tools that should help us get ever closer to that goal. So Norman Bor Borlaug is our role model when we grew up, we want to be just like him. <laughs> and uh, we want to uh, try and do our bit, even if it's a small fraction of what he's done. I'll now turn the program over to our leader, Roger Beachy. I'm especially grateful to Roger and his scientific col colleagues, for they're the ones who are making our hopes and dreams for this center come true. Roger. Thanks, Bill. I, I want to join Dr. Danforth in welcoming you to this uh, very special event for us this evening, and, and thanks again for joining us. It is my very great pleasure to introduce and to present uh, the Danforth Award for Plant Science to uh, Norman Borlaug. Dr. Borlaug is someone whose name I first got to know as a graduate student in the 60s as someone who was making a real and significant uh, uh, impact and a difference through his work in agriculture and was, was then already recognized as someone doing something unique an outstanding scientist that was working in Mexico. Norm was born and raised in Iowa on a farm, enjoyed the rigors of education, sports, and recreation in, in a small town Midwest. He was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, and, and although he initially failed the entrance exam, <laughs> go figure that one, and the wisdom of the testers, uh, went on to achieve great things. He was an undergraduate major in forestry, and while studying, he was also a wrestler. Norman Borlaug is indeed was inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. As an undergraduate, uh, he was inspired uh, by a compelling lecture by an outstanding plant pathologist, uh, E. Charles Stakeman, a name that probably means very little to members of this audience, but he himself was a giant in the field of plant pathology, my own course of study. And he was studying wheat rust. He convinced Norm to be involved in plant pathology and later in breeding, and he, and, uh, he did become therein engaged. In 1942, he received the PhD degree in plant breeding from the University of Minnesota. Then after declining an offer from the private sector, the, the newly mentored Dr. Borlaug gained experience through crop breeding, uh, an initiative that was originally sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation through their work in Mexico, and he began his work at a new institute in El Batan outside of Mexico City. 
the institute was then was to become part of the consultative group on international agriculture. And if you've spent some time around the Danforth Center, you've, you've heard me refer to the CGIAR as these group of originally uh, 13, now I think 16 or 17 member institutions that serve uh, agriculture and food uh, in, uh, in countries around the world. These days, he splits his time between CIMIT, uh, at this, this center in Mexico, where he remains a consultant on a project in, in plant breeding, still engaged, and at Texas A&M University. As part of his work at CIMIT in the early 1950s and 60s, uh, Dr. Borlaug and his colleagues identified a strategy that would lead to significant increase in production of wheat from Mexico. The approach was magnified then through research in India and Pakistan and other parts of the world while being applied to local varieties of wheat, rice, and other grains. In essence, Dr. Borlaug's group developed breeding strategies that would produce wheat plants that were shorter in stature and thus put more of their energy into the grain instead of into the stalk and resulted in much higher yields. The shorter stems were also stronger and thus less likely to collapse when the winds and the rains came. The work was so successful and it was later adapted to other crops in other countries, including India, where wheat and rice production was significantly enhanced. Indeed, it changed India from a country that was food insecure when I was a graduate student to one that produced sufficient wheat and rice to meet its needs, as it, as it then later did. The incredible results of this work led to what uh, was called the Green Revolution, for which Dr. Borlaug received the Nobel Prize for peace. Indeed, his, his work is credited for saving many, many lives, as Dr. Danforth indicated, through the success of increasing crop yields. But as you can expect, Dr. Borlaug has received many, many awards through his illustrious career. Universities around the globe have given him honorary degrees, including the University of Missouri at Columbia. I won't list that list because it would take us the rest of the hour. He has many buildings uh, named for him, even art commemorated in his behalf, and, and so on many more than we can mention today. And amongst the honors, perhaps the most recognized is the Nobel Peace Prize, which was awarded in 1970. The most recent awards were made within the last, within the last month. On January 26th, he was honored by the government of India with a Padma, and I'm sure I'll say it wrong, Vibhasan Award, India's second highest national award. In fact, Norm is the first non-Indian to receive that award. Uh, on February 13th, President Bush awarded Dr. Borlaug the National Medal of Science, our nation's highest scientific honor. And in early March, Dr. Borlaug, ex Dr. Borlaug is expected to accompany President Bush to India, where the President will describe the U.S. commitment to the Knowledge Initiative in Agriculture, KIA, uh, a joint initiative between our two governments. Norm continues to amaze us all with his active calendar, his interest in science and technology as it can be applied to serve the people of the world, and for his eclectic interest in all types of science, in economics, in policy, and other disciplines. Now, when I called Norm, or I actually, uh, you, should, you must meet Chris Oswell, who also uh, accompanies Norm. When I called Norm uh, through Chris to offer the Danforth Award for Planned Science, he was satisfactorily pleased. I didn't see, I didn't say, he was really grateful. I said he was satisfactorily pleased because he's received so many awards. Norm said the greatest pleasure for him is not to be, is, is to be here to learn the science. And so he's, he said he would agree to come if he had more than just a half a day, but we can spend the whole, in fact, we have two and a half days with Dr. Borlaug here. I think all of our scientists are having a chance to visit with him. He wants to know what we do. And it is, really is a testament to the kind of research uh, interest that, uh, that Norm has. He last visited about three and a half years ago, but in fact, he was here on, the, uh, on July 30th in 98 when uh, President Carter was here and uh, Senator Danforth when the announcement of the Danforth Center was made. Uh, for those of you who were at that, at that wonderful reception at the, at the museum, we had, it was quite, quite an event and we were very pleased uh, to have Dr. Borlaug with us then. So as a consequence, he has a very busy schedule in his several and a half days. He's learning from us and we are certainly learning from him. Dr. Borlaug is a man of science, and his invigorating attitude towards science remains, science remains as strong as ever. We're honored to have him with us tonight to receive the Danforth Award in Plant, in plant Science. Norm?
Thank you, Roger. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real privilege for me to be here today. Uh, as uh, Roger pointed out, I was privileged to be here when the announcement for the founding of this uh, organization was mentioned, and then a second time, a couple of years ago. And this morning, I enjoyed very much having an opportunity to speak to or listen to many of your staff members explain the work that you are doing. Uh, I'm going to try to give you a picture of the, what happened in the Green Revolution and how I look at the problems of world food production for the next uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, my colleague Chris Doswell and I have picked out some uh, PowerPoints that we think will be uh, helpful in uh, making this presentation uh, rapidly to give you a picture of uh, uh, how this happened and how I perceive things will uh, unfold in the future. Have we got some problems here? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I joined uh, the first foreign technical assistance program to uh, assist a food, definition, a food deficient nation in 1944, namely the Rockefeller Foundation Mexican government program. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation had never been involved in agriculture before. They were primarily engaged in public health and in education. And it was uh, with pressure in part by Henry Wallace after he had, as vice president, visited Mexico in 1940 and knew of the needs. And he had uh, promised to help the government of Mexico. And of course, this was the 1st of uh, December, 1940. And on, uh, December 7th, 41, other things happened, which made it impossible for the US government to comply with this oral commitment. And so, as a result, he communicated with the head of the Rockefeller Foundation about the need, and that's how it came to be that Rockefeller was involved. Let me point out that this was the pioneer program it preceded the Marshall Plan by five years, and point four uh, in the president uh, uh, addressed to the nation, six years. So it was really pioneering. Nobody knew how to do this, and we didn't either. So we moved. The purpose of that program, as you can see here, was multidisciplinary across all of the disciplines that bear on uh, agricultural production. The three basic crops were corn, maize in Mexico, and Latin America, beans and wheat. And I was given the privilege of working on the least important one of all, wheat. Uh, and. Uh, the purpose was to train a new generation of scientists uh, to develop the basic information and research needed to increase production, to transfer it to farmers' fields. And I have to remind you that at that time, there were no extension service, no employees of extension people anywhere in Mexico. And this was not true only of Mexico. It's pretty largely true, or uh, was at that time, of Central America, much of South America. So we did the research. We had to take it to the farmers' fields for testing it, and then later be involved indirectly uh, in trying to influence policy so that this could be adopted. 
Uh, I'll move on to uh, this explains one of the reasons for the broad adaptation of those Mexican wheats. And this was designed by an emergency. There was a visionary uh, Mexican political leader, Rodolfo Elias Calles, son of a president, was interested in agriculture, himself a farmer from the state of Sonora. And he had established in 1934, when he became president or governor of the state of Sonora, what must have been a model experiment station for all of Latin America, with good facilities, uh, physical facilities, big orchard, uh, two breeds of blooded cattle, swine, poultry of all kinds, sheep, goats, and uh, the only thing he was missing was trained scientists. The one scientist that did a fairly good job introduced a couple of varieties of wheat, and they did well. This scientist was transferred to Mexico to assume the responsibilities for all research. A person without experience was left there. Came three successive disastrous stem rust epidemics of wheat in 39, 40, and 41. And under those conditions, or when I began to work in Mexico, it was standard practice all around the world, growing one generation of segregating material a year, which meant it took 10 years to produce a rust-resistant variety. I knew that since already, from 39 to 41, I should say 41 to 44, already three years had gone by, I wasn't going to have 10. And so I started the shuttle breeding, growing the first generation in the commercial area in Sonora uh, at about 20, uh, 28 and a half degrees latitude, 100 uh, meters, 300 feet above sea level under irrigation, taking the best plants with the best seed, planting them at 18 and a half degrees latitude, 700 miles further south, but high enough in the mountains so the temperatures were favorable. Different diseases, taking the best plants back to Sonora, cut the breeding time in half. This was before photoperiodism was understood or thought to be important. It led to the broad adaptation and broad disease resistance that later was used in the transfer and formation of the so-called green technology across Asia. And those lines feeding out from there was what happened in the transfer of that technology many years later through young trainees who were brought to Mexico in huge numbers and trained not only in the discipline of plant breeding, but in agronomy and soil uh, control of weeds, all of the factors bearing on crop production as best we could do with a few uh, staff members. So that was the origin of the so-called Green Revolution. Here you can see the, uh, what took place. There was none of this high-yield wheat technology present anywhere in Asia in 1961. The first introductions were in 65. At that time, there was severe hunger and verging on, on famine in India. Bad situation in Pakistan. It was worse in China, but we didn't know. We couldn't see through the uh, bamboo curtain of China at that time. But the hunger and famine there at that same period was much worse. Now, on the left is what happened in wheat. Uh, on the right-hand column in rice, there was 14 million hectares. The first introduction, as I said, were in 65. By 1970, there were 14 million hectares, 20% of the total wheat area. 
by the year 2000, it was up to 7 million and 84% uh, and so on. The same for rice. They followed, rice followed on the heels of wheat. Uh, now, what were the factors that changed it? First of all, irrigation area doubled from 87 million to 178 million. Uh, more important was plant nutrients. First of all, let me say this. When I talk about fertilizer so that there's no misunderstanding, I've always said use all the organic fertilizer that's available. But it's very confusing and very disgusting in the third world when people come from the affluent nation and tell the third world political leaders that we can produce the food that's needed for 6.4 billion people with organic fertilizer alone. Look what's happened. This is uh, nutrients of fertilizer. Went from 2 million tons to 77 million tons. Now you have to use that right, the right combination of nutrients. There's no time to go into that. But that played a very key role on worn out land. The amount of mechanization has uh, increased from uh, practically none, 200,000 units to now. Uh, six million or so. But the important key here is production in those developing countries went from 300 million to the, uh, about a billion, more than three folds in those periods. We move on and what were some of the other indirect effects? Well, first of all, the amount of land required to make that big change in production. But let's look at the world, not just that, because there's a lot of confusion comes out of the affluent nations of Western Europe, and we have some of it here too, that comes into this picture about how we try to handle food production in the third world. Uh, I think this uh, slide Ill illustrates it very well. The food, uh, the world cereal, all cereals produced in 1950 was 650 million metric tons of grain. By the year 2000, it was a billion, 900 million. You will notice from that yellow line on the graph, there's only about 10% increase in area cultivated. Uh, and the production of the billion, 900 million was attained on 660 million metric, or 660 million hectares of land. Of course, uh, excuse me for using the metric system. I've lived in it so long, but if you want it in acres, multiply, multiply it by 2.5 to get the acres from hectares. Had we tried to produce the harvest of 19, uh, of the year 2000, with the technology of 1950, we would have cultivated, had to have cultivated another 1.1 billion hectares of land. Where would we have got, of the same quality, we would have cut down most of our forest, plowed up much of our pasture land, unsuited for agriculture. What would have happened to erosion? What would have happened to habitat for wildlife? Here in our country, since much of the land not needed for production has reverted back to, to uh, uh, forest or to unused land, wildlife has come back. I was born and grew up in the Turkey River drainage system in northeast Iowa. There were no uh, white-tailed deer there when I was a boy. Now they're there so that they've become pests because had we used the land to produce the more food rather than the high yield technology, 
we would have destroyed the, the Turkey River. There were no turkeys there when I was a boy. My dad said there were none when he was a boy. My granddad said, yeah, there were still a few around when he was a boy. Now they're all over. That's because good wildlife management have brought them back. They've found us suitable habitat. So you see, agriculture and the high yield technology is not necessarily an enemy of the environment. It can be a blessing. We move on. But we still got lots of hungry, miserable people in the world. And uh, there you can see that we've got uh, about uh, 200 million in sub-Saharan Africa, a like number still in South Asia, 230. And we've got uh, quite a few more in other parts of Asia, in East uh, Asia especially. Latin America, we've still got too many. And we've got some in our own surroundings, not big numbers. But we've got the wherewithal to cope with this, if we've got the will to do it. Uh, who are they? Many of them are rural people, farmers. Look at the 50% farmers in marginal land. And uh, so on, urban poor, landless labor. We got a big job ahead. But don't let me forget to say how much worse would it have been had there not been this use of high yield technology in the last half of the last century. And we'll go on to see some of this in the slides ahead. 80% of the future world food production will have to come from land that's already under production. And that means this is where we have to have additional increase in yield, better protection, protection of our crops against the losses uh, if we're going to achieve this. There are, in Asia, there's no more land, in, especially in China and India, to be brought under cultivation. It mostly has to be through increased yield per acre. And uh, there's limited potential for additional irrigation. But there are some areas, as you will see, uh, in the next slide or so, that uh, where expansion can take place. This is the so-called Cerrados of Brazil. These are acid soils. These have never been farmed. They attempted to farm in colonial time. You'd go, to, you'd go broke. You'd starve to death. And uh, it wasn't until the 60s that the research started to understand these soils. They had been leached in geologic time, and we have some of those same soils in sub-Saharan Africa. Mother Nature did this, not humankind. Leached them up there, essential nutrients, made them acid, and they researched to lime them, and it had to be with dolomitic so that it was both calcium and magnesium because both were so low that they became limiting nutrients for the plants as well as the acidity, which was a detriment. And uh, then the nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, sulfur in some places, minor element, all of these pieces have come together now. And this is an area that has rainfall that's adequate for agriculture. It's 100 million hectares of land. Most of the topography is suitable if properly managed. There are some areas too rough, too sloping that can be used for it. Uh, intensive agriculture. So this is the one area, and we have soils like this in Africa, but we have, in our pro small program, stayed away from it. We have no transport. That'll come out in the next slide. Uh, but this will help 
world food situation. But you need to remember this. Most of the additional food that will be used will have to be produced in the food deficit country. But once you get your industries going, like China is now, it's still essentially self-sufficient in food, except it's been Im importing the last three or four years big quantities of soybeans from the U.S. and from Brazil. They can afford to do it with their industry. Look at the big balance of payment. They couldn't do this before their agriculture was transformed. The same is true of, uh, of uh, India. They can import now when they couldn't before and pay hard cash to do so. And that was possible because of uh, improved <coughs> agricultural productivity, which permitted industrialization. Uh, we move uh, and water. This is the limiting factor. Were it not for this, there would be vast tracts of land that were suitable for agricultural production. Seventy percent of the water that's uh, uh, withdrawn from the subsoil or from uh, the reservoirs above the ground is used for irrigation. But it constitutes only 17% of the cultivated area. But it produces 40% of the total harvest. So it's very important. And those bed plantings there, you know, this is the work done by uh, Dr. Sayer in Simon who has used this technology developed in Sonora, Mexico, uh, and the farmers themselves had a lot to do with this. Moved to India, China, uh, Pakistan, and it's moving into other countries. By planting on beds, especially with zero tillage, this changes just the saving of water, planting on beds rather than flat irrigation saves 20 to 25 percent of water. In addition, it saves about that same percentage of, uh, of fertilizer, makes it more efficient. So we have to do more agronomic research to utilize that water uh, better. And in double cropping on beds, you don't need to plow that whole thing after rice. You just plant on top of the old beds use zero tillage with the uh, herbicide treatment and proper fertilization. And uh, it, again, is how agronomic practices uh, move along. Now, drought resistance. Up until recently, most of this has been through conventional breeding like I was involved with. But with the new biotechnology, there is going to be big progress. Even now, the corn on the lower left side, on the right is the strain that was selected out of those same basic populations. And you can see the big increase in production. In wheat here on your right, in the foreground, is drought susceptible compared to the background. And, of course, these are different uh, examples of drought. We move on. And uh, increasing genetic yield potential. We have to keep pushing on that front. And the new biotechnology uh, may open, must open, avenues to try to increase total yield potential per acre as well. We have to have uh, an increase of 30, 40 percent uh, in many of those areas to be able to reach this target of doubling by production from 19 or 2000 to 2050. And uh, bi biotechnology is going to have to play, uh, play a key role. I'm a firm believer of the uh, working together, private sector and public sector. Uh, I have spent a good share of my life, most of it, in battling 
bureaucracies in the public sector. That's where I've spent most of my life. And boy, it's frustrating. <laughs> so we have to cope with all of these problems in addition to the technical and scientific problems if we're going to change food production. And uh, we move on to the real big area problem, Africa. This is the most frustrating part of the world I've ever worked in. Chris and I have been there trying to do something. President Carter is involved in the same organization. Sasakawa has been the funding agency, a Japanese foundation, and uh, uh, they have been a very generous and liberal organization have given us the same flexibilities in how we use those funds within reasonable limits as I enjoyed way back in the 1940s with the Rockefeller Foundation. But despite that, we've worked in those countries trying, we're not a research organization. We went to those countries, President Carter and the Sasakawa family, we went to the universities, the government experiment station. We found a quite a bit of information that had been developed. None of it was being tested on farm. So our little organization is an extension program demonstrating if we put all of those factors together, what we can do with the knowledge now available. And with these simple things, improve the best input, or improved varieties, uh, moderate amounts of fertilizer, good stands of plants. You gotta get plants before you can produce food. You can't have big gaps, or you can't have too many weeds competing. So, but with that, this is what's happened. We've probably had 500,000 demonstration on farms. Uh, south of the Sahara in the last 18, 19 years. And the green is what the yields are in our demonstration plots with that simple technology compared to the national uh, yields of each country. Some of them, of course, are much higher in Ethiopia and Malawi happens to have hybrids. We have the dilemma in the developing world that uh, the small uh, farmers are so small, they can't afford or to buy hybrid seed every year. So most of the emphasis has been, until very recently, open pollinated varieties. So they get good foundation seed, they may use it for quite a few years, it gets contaminated and all of the other things. But the economy, of the small farmer is such that they can't buy seed. We hope that if we get this thing going, this will change. It's already starting to change. Uh, we move on to the one thing that was done, this was done with conventional genetics. Uh, the high lysine and high tryptophan maize, which of course uh, changes the nutritional value of corn or maize dramatically. Uh, it was first checked with uh, pigs, and the two pigs from the same litter, one a little scrawny thing and the other one three or four times as big. It was repeated with other test animals and finally with children. And the benefits to the third world where meat is scarce or unavailable, milk is, also scarce. This has tremendous implication. And what is being done now with biotechnology on vitamins and, and uh, all of these accrue to improving agriculture and human nutrition. We have problems with this. It's a recessive gene. That means inblown pollen uh, nullifies the gene's effect all kinds of problems, but you keep battling. You could solve it very easily if we could use F1 hybrids, because then the contamination doesn't come into the picture. 
But that's the way it the East and the Third World. So we move on. And uh, people, uh, fertilizer, Africa, problems. Look where the consumption of uh, plant and fertilizer nutrients is now for China. It's just about up to the level of UK more than France, more than the U.S. And uh, look where uh, India is, about like the USA, a little less. Had that chart been made in 1960, India and China would be down where the African countries are now. You can't see a few pounds of fertilizer per acre. That's what happened with the change in production that was made possible by fertilizer. So we move on, and uh, Africa was left behind for a number of other reasons. Diseases, not just diseases of human beings, some of which are terrible, the home of malaria, and more recently, of course, with HIV, it's a disaster with the lack of education, knowledge of the general public. But other diseases like trypanosomiasis, which is uh, transmitted by the tsetse fly, as a result, there are no animals in much of West Africa. That means there were never oxen like we had in early colonial times. There are no horses. So they're still with a hole and a machete. But with zero tillage, you put the gene into the main crop varieties, especially uh, in transgenics. This opens a whole new area of possibility. There's no shortage of land in Africa. But with traditional hole and machete, the family can only control the weeds in about three to five acres. If they could double the area, they could produce enough to sell and buy, begin to buy. But with this technology, it opens a new door, and that's what new biotechnology can do. Of course, there are other benefits already available. It, but Look at the indirect effects, the cut back on the erosion and conserving soil moisture. You can plant when the moisture is right and kill the weeds which come up with the crop you plant. It gives great flexibility in production. And uh, this is the curse of Africa. No roads, no infrastructure. Uh, look at and this is per million of population. We have uh, 20,000, 21,000 kilometers multiplied by six tenths, if you want, miles. Uh, and uh, look at the Indian or the African countries, 59 kilometers. Everything's moved on the back, human back mostly on the heads of women. And that means that if you have big production in one part of the country, excuse me, you can have famine in another part of the same country 200 miles away. You can't move the grain. You can't, the, moving the fertilizer in costs two to three times more than our farmers would pay for it. So this infrastructure roads, and we'll see, I think, in this next slide. Uh, we need a Marshall Plan on roads, and that road does lots of things. It doesn't have to be paved like that is shown, or asphalt. Even gravel roads, if you've got a network, so you can move inputs one area to another and market the inputs that are needed, like fertilizer. But look at the real benefits. 
where there's a road, there's soon a school. Not one, but a whole series of schools, primary schools. And soon after there are schools, there's a medical officer. And then there's an old beat up bus or truck, people moving across, and that's knocking down cause ethnic borders, tribal borders, linguistic borders. And remember that Africa is still a continent of how many? You get many answers, 100, 200 different tribes. That road starts lots of change, and we don't have them. And, uh, so the GMOs, I've already mentioned uh, what some of the benefits are that's coming with those on the zero tillage. You know, the herbicide resistance, of course, that has swept to, across soybean production done nearby. Uh, your neighbors nearby Monsanto to get this into the soybean varieties is widely used uh, in many parts of the world. The BT gene into cotton, into corn, already these things are functioning. There will be great improvements in nutritional quality. I mentioned the one with conventional genetics, high lysine and high tryptophan, but the new vitamin, the golden rice and others. And the stress uh, resistance to drought and to, I dare say, it's not only to drought. What would happen if you could put uh, into corn um, so that it stand two degrees of frost? You plant earlier when there's generally plenty of moisture so that you would have your crop set before the hot, dry is part of July and early August. There are lots of things that will come from this. And we move on to uh, the BT cotton. Some people say, well, this biotechnology doesn't help the little farmer. But BT cotton is a good example. The little farmer in parts of Africa, in uh, Egypt, or in uh, China, India, Pakistan, are using this. And what happens in the reduction in insecticide, where there's no bull weevil like we have, uh, with one or at the most two applications in the seedlings control, thrips and aphids, all the rest are taken care of by the TD, BT gene. It changes everything. And in cotton production, uh, of course, I don't want to play down the uh, importance of uh, integrated pest control, because with our own boll weevil, uh, which decimated our own cotton production, uh, it licks its chops when you put on BT or insecticides, for most insecticides. But with the integrated pest control in the last 10 years, and I thought I would never live to see this, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida are free of boll weevil. Most of Alabama, Mississippi, parts of Louisiana and Texas. That simplifies, reduces Again, the amount of insecticide, if you want to go back into cotton, how much cotton can be absorbed into the world market is another problem. But you see how technology in one thing impacts on many others in agricultural production. And uh, the amount of poisoning of the people handling uh, conventional production versus Biotechnology is something else. Uh, there you are. There's the story. Ten million hectares 
of land under Bt cotton, and it represents, since most of them are small, seven million small farmers. They entered the market better than ever before. They got something to sell, and they begin to buy. Everything starts to change. It's not magic. It doesn't happen overnight. And there we have where uh, global uh, GMO is being used at the present time. The countries on your left, the U.S., about 50 million hectares, Argentina second, Brazil is finally moving up and admitting that they had quite a bit before, wasn't labeled that way. But uh, uh, Canada with the, its uh, oil seed and so on. Uh, and of course the main crops where it's taking place at the present time is soybean, maize or corn, cotton and canola. So we move on to you know, sometimes when you live for five, six decades in foreign agriculture with all the frustrations, and we got a big one now, uh, you have to have some dreams to keep you halfway sane. And uh, these are some of my dreams. Finally, Largely, not only through Mexico, but through those Mexican wheats, we've had no rust epidemic for 50 years since the bad disasters that swept across U.S. and Canada in 1950, one, two, three, and four. Working together with those trainees in many of these countries, we had a network of testing all of our materials. It worked, and it was respected by both private sector, it was participant private sector, government sector. But those days are gone. Those people have retired or died or they move into better jobs. You know, in the train, shortage of trained people in the third world, makes you train them for a job in agriculture. But the pay is always miserable. And so other opportunities attract uh, them to other aspects, other jobs. That means we have to continue to train these people or it breaks down. And it's broken down right now in some of the things. But in the case of these rusts, there's one cereal crop that never has had rust since it split off the Puccinia, split off from all of the other uh, graminii, the grasses. Wheat is cursed more. It's got three different rusts, plus many hundreds of different strains in each species. Oats is equally bad. Barley is less so, but it's got them. Corn, sorghum, they've all got them. Rice doesn't have any. So in my dream, I don't know if we have some young people here. Maybe with a little luck, even you middle-aged scientists will make that transfer. And then maybe the wheat scientists and the old scientists can go fishing for a day or two <laughs> rather than be on this treadmill. And I say that because now we have a new race of stem rust in East Africa, Kenya, and Ethiopia, Uganda, that has the virulence to knock out 70% of all the wheat that's grown in India, Pakistan, China, Egypt, uh, Turkey. Complacency did it. Bureaucracy did it, lack of budgeting contributed to it, and here we are. So again, last year, we re got some money from the USDA and from Rockefeller Foundation and Sasakawa, and we screened about, what, eight, nine hundred thousand uh, different lines from Canada, US, Pakistan, Australia, we find resistance, but to replace the seed 
will take three years. That should have been started in 19, or in the year 2000 or 2001. We finally got it started last year. So we got three years where we have to do a lot of praying and have a lot of good luck to replace those. So all of the, and this is the story we know on a different rust, how it moved from the Near East across into India and Pakistan. And this is in the 60s and 70s. So we know that these things move and move fast. These can be carried hundreds of miles uh, on the wind. If they land on a susceptible variety, the moisture is there. It doesn't need to be rain, dew. And if the temperature is right, you can generate a disastrous epidemic. People told me the last year or so in traveling Asia, oh, stem rust is no longer a problem. We've just got to pay attention to stripe rust and leaf rust. I've seen what happened here in the 50s, the disaster. And the curious thing, the only person, as I've mentioned this for the last two years, you know who said, I know about this? The dean of the medical school at Harvard, when I gave the address there two years ago, uh, I said, you know, we're talking about the chicken, the avian flu and the airborne thing moving with wildlife. I said, we forget that we have these pests like stem rust that and I just repeated that swept across the US and Canada. And when he said, thank you, he said, I know about stem rust. I was born in Saskatchewan, and when I was five and six years old, my daddy lost the whole crop I know about. It's curious, you'd have to find it in Harvard Medical School. <laughs> and why do we have shortages for some of the things that will help to change the third world, especially roads and schools and hospitals and medical care? Look at how the world spends its money. 56 countries that have less internal conflict because a little better food. I have the most internal conflict. Very often this becomes civil wars and it can spread to neighboring countries. Look at the budget we spend, the world, $900 billion a year. And which country suffered most from the Cold War? The African country. They just received their independence and the pitch, whether it was the Soviets, now you have to protect yourself, we'll help you with military materials, armament, you pay for half of it, we pay for half. The Western allies, of which we were a part, the same song. The African countries spent 25 years spending their money and military instead of roads and schools and hospitals and agricultural improvement. That's the situation we have. And we still have nearly a billion people who are literate adults, 900 million if you want to take the figure per se. Those are adults, and in addition, 120 million of primary school, not in school, until this has changed. We aren't going to change those countries very fast, and military isn't going to keep things stable, no matter what kind of military. These are human suffering that uh, have persisted, but it's much more explosive now 
with television and communication happening in one part of the world in a few seconds or minutes is all around the world. And even in those remote villages, there will be some one television set or radio set so that from the standpoint of communication, the world is shrunk and it affects everything. So Lord Boyd Orr, the first director of the Food and Agriculture Organization, had this to say, you can't build peace on empty stump, to which I add, and human misery. Thank you very much. I'd be glad to. Yes, we if have the, one or two questions for Dr. Boyle. There is one. Uh, the short one, the quick one. Comment? <laughs> yes, please. You'll have to repeat it for my sure. uh, Before my question, I would like to thank you for saving my life. I'm one of those one man. <laughs> <laughs> New varieties of wheat in India. How does this compare to the biotech scale now? I think you understand that when, you, when the introduction of the issue was short growing yeah. in, in, uh, in India in the, in the 60s, whether really, uh, the oh. difficulty there compared to the difficulty of GM. Well, first, whenever you try to provoke change in agriculture or in any other aspect of human endeavor, you're dealing with ultra-conservatism at the top. It's been a long struggle to gain this position of power in government or in science. And there's misery all around you, shortage of food. If I don't do anything, and I used to challenge them with this, if you don't do anything, you're walking backwards because population is growing. Ah, uh, but they would say, but that won't be my fault. That's somebody else's fault. Some other aspect of the government that hasn't done this. Now, specifically about the wheats in your original <laughs> native home, was it India or Pakistan? India. India. Okay, first, there were top scientists that said, my God, we're already starving, and now we grow these short wheats, and we won't have any straw, any busa. Busa is the ground straw that the cattle are fed during the long, dry winters. So now you're going to make it worse by bringing in these dwarf wheats. So now the cattle will starve, which also produce our milk. It's not only us. And then the color of the grain at that time that was available in Mexico happened to be red. We had gone through this exercise in Mexico, and I had manipulated intentionally up to a point, so they accepted both white and red grain based on the quality of the grain that were released. So they had acceptable milling and baking quality. And color is not important in those things where you mill, you take off the outer layer with the coloring. Mix. But you go through the agony of that. For example, there were two top scientists. Just to give you a feel for the kind of dealings you have to go through, the patience and the frustrations. At a meeting that the Ford Foundation had, I was supposed to attend in, in Lahore, Pakistan. This would have been in 1966 uh, spring. Uh, 
there was a bad snowstorm on the flights were all canceled in New York and this was before the time of the jets it was still DC sixes and so I was couldn't get back in the hotel there was no home uh, rooms I was too nice without too nice without sleep and I got to the airport in Karachi and uh, Mr. Hansen, who was the Ford Foundation director, he said, you go to this halfway house. This was a KLM halfway house before the hotels on the airport. You take a shower, we have to leave at seven o'clock to go to this big meeting about what's gonna be done about this miserable Mexican wheat. <laughs> so, so I took the shower and went up there and the cards were stacked. The Minister of Agriculture, he was a shrewd politician and he knew the facts, but he put the deputy chairman in charge of that meeting, deputy uh, minister of agriculture, whom I'd never met. There was Hanson at Ford Foundation, Narvaez, my Mexican uh, top scientist who was then working for Ford and the Norwegian economist working for Ford Foundation. They were on the other side. And then these three professors that were challenging the whole thing, that the oxen, the cattle were going to die from the short straw. Nobody would eat these, uh, these red grain weeds. And uh, I told my colleagues across the, the table, in Spanish. I said, don't get into this. Let me do it. If I get thrown out of the country, you people can carry on. <laughs> <laughs> and so I innocently, I said, no, let's see. Last year, you had uh, about three and a half million tons of imported wheat, mostly under PL type of uh, easy payment soft currency, not only U.S., but similar kinds of sales from Canada and Australia. Now, will you kindly tell me what was the color of the green from the U.S.A.? They said, it's red. I said, you're wrong. Or they said, white. And I said, you're wrong. It was all red. The only white wheat U.S. gross is shipped to Japan for noodles with the rice. I said, okay, Canada, what was the color of this grain? He said, white. I said, Canada doesn't grow any white wheat. It was red. And finally I said, now Australia, what was the situation there? What was the color of that grain? By then he said, red. I said, you're wrong again, it was all white. <laughs> so three pitches, three strikes, and struck out completely. But this kind of nonsense goes on. And it went on with taste. We had to have taste tests on chapatis made from four coded numbers. And then old Indian, old Pakistan, and two Mexican wheat. And the minister was then the judge himself. And just by straight luck, nobody can taste these differences. The two Mexicans came out on top. So you're dealing with all of this kind of nonsense. You have to have the patience of Job and uh, sometimes a little more. But you can't quit. It's got to become a part of you if you're going, because why? You train these young scientists, they're underneath, and if you let them down, then you have hurt them. And yet, they, at, in, soon after they come back from foreign training, they can't speak out because of their own bureaucracy. We have some of that here too, but not to the same degree. So. That's what it's like in the third world. But I've survived 61 years of it, and I can still try to fight a good fight, even though I can't hear. Now, that's a big advantage. Now, don't, 
don't hear all the criticism. I, I used to say that it would be a blessing if I had developed a hide as thick as that of a rhinoceros or an elephant, so you didn't feel all of those darts. But after you get callous to it, it's kind of a challenge. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Borlaug. What a great treat, and uh, how exciting it is to uh, see what you've done with science to improve the lot of humankind. We will have a reception upstairs, and I hope everyone can come and visit. Thank you.